Let's start with this question, which has been the concern for most Nigerians, you know, the issue of tax reforms. Will you say is a necessity looking at uh, the present situation guiding, you know, tax policies in Nigeria when it comes to issue of regulation, duplication of taxes, and some of the uh, issues guiding tax policy in Nigeria? Do you consider that to be a necessity and why, if it is? Yes, um, I would say that um, we are actually on the right direction. We are taking the right step. It's uh, long overdue for us to have this uh, reform. Um, though we've been having some reforms on an annual basis through our annual finance act that started from 2019, but there's always need for an holistic review of our tax system. You know, when we do the finance act, we do the review in bits and pieces, and this has not really made us to deal with all the issues at a go. But it would be good for us to have this reform looked at. In fact, one of the things that we need to do is the review of our tax laws, you know, a, a general review. And I think that's one of the things that the committee is looking at. We also have issues around the state taxes. We have issues around the local government taxes, which I believe that... Um, if we all, if we look at, if this committee is able to come up with an holistic review, we'll address these issues. And um, when we do this um, tax policy reform, and we are able to make the tax system to be investor friendly, and also be a system where taxpayers can easily pay their taxes without being compelled, um, the understanding of the tax laws are so easy, basic, so there's no excuse that I don't know will not be there. So it is something that is a welcome development, and they have the right people that are being and, and being it. I know Tawe Dele has been an advocate of simplifying the tax system. He has always been at the forefront of government making the life of Nigerians to be easy, making life not to be difficult for Nigerians. And coming on board this committee, I think he has uh, what it takes. Uh, it's only that you know when you have this type of work to do, you have to also carry along everybody and be sure that um, everybody is. Um, fully aligned in whatever is being proposed. So I think the reform is, is right. It's the right time to do it. Now that we have a new government, now that we are looking at uh, a sustainable way of um, maintaining our revenue, uh, revenue generation. If you look at it in the past uh, uh, four or five years, we've been seeing that tax revenue has been the source of funding for the uh, federal government. And the states have also been getting their own share through the um, uh, alloc fact allocation. So uh, the tax reform is a welcome idea. And some of the things that have been coming out out of the work of this committee has really made us to know that uh, we have what it takes to make the tax environment uh, better and also to be easier for the taxpayers. But one thing is this, even at all this that, we're being, that is being done, it's good for taxpayers to also see taxpayers' money at work. And I want to believe that the essence of this reform committee is not just to tell us how to pay tax better, how government collect revenue better, but how to also make the life of taxpayers better in the midst of trying to be compliant with the tax regulations and being a good citizens of Nigeria. Thank you very much. Okay, happy new year to you too, because it's the first time that uh, we would see you this year. I need to see that to you as well. Happy Not new just year. Really saying happy new year. Happy new year. <laughs> All right, so Nadir aims to boost tax collections by 57% in this year, 2024. And one of the issues with tax has been the collection, uh, where it is seen to have some leakages. Now, Taiwo Yedili proposed that the training of area boys or people on the boys on the streets for tax collection. What's your take on that? Do you find it uh, uh, a recommendation that will have feasible implementation? Um, I, I would not say it won't assist in what we're trying to achieve. We have a lot of collection agents, and it's right to say the area boys. If you go to some states, on the road you have roadblocks. And who are the people that are mounting the roadblocks? They are not the government officials. They are people that have been appointed, maybe third parties, that collect this money. Some of them are not even appointed. They just decide that uh, we are in charge. This is our land. This is our road. And they force the, the taxpayers to pay funny levies and, and charges, which are not even in any law. 
So if we have this education of the people to know the right way to approach this tax collection, it will help. But that's notwithstanding, they may not even understand so much as to the benefit for them. If they see that if they collect the right tax, the right way, and government is able to use it to make their own life better, then they would be able to do it better. I want to say that tax education is necessary for not only the area boys, for everybody, from government, federal, to state, to local government, to taxpayer, to market women, to students. Because when we all understand what tax obligations are, and understand the whole objective of tax collection and understand the benefit of paying the taxes, then we would now all align and synchronize in the way we approach tax revenue generation. Now, one thing is for the area boy to collect the money and feel that it is our national cake and it doesn't go into the government pot. And government is still struggling to be able to provide infrastructure for this same set of people to use. But if government is able to educate them and also let them see the benefits in this for them, not just collecting it, but when you collect and you remit and it comes to government account, these are the things we want to do. These are the things we will do. And these are the things we have done, which is accountability. When you do the education and you crown it with responsibility and accountability, then the area boys we're talking about, we understand why they need to be educated and why they need to collect this money and pay it into government posts. And why they should also hold government accountable for whatever is being collected and remitted to government posts. So I think it's not just education. You have to supply, you have to, you know, do the education and back this up with accountability and responsibility on the part of the government, whether it's the local government, whether it's the state government, whether it's the federal government. And there's transparency. And I think this would do some, it may not be totally something that you can achieve in a day. Because when you're talking about area boys, we have different categories of area boys. So he also needs to shed more light on that to tell us how best. Because one thing is for you to give us a proposal, and that is for you to tell us how to implement it seamlessly. Because when you implement and at the end of the day you get stuck, you cannot achieve the objective, then it's like back to square one. So I want to believe that the working papers or the working principle or the implementation plan for this will also be, be shared. And we all will see this and see how feasible it will be. But it cannot remove the hands of the unions in this. We have pressure groups. So if you're going to educate the area boys, you must also know that these area boys have a union, that you must make sure that they bind into what you're proposing. And I think that is necessary. And for every, every group we have in this country, tax education is important. But you can't do it in isolation of the body that brings them together. If the body is able to buy into what you're saying, they are able to convince their members, and that makes it to be seamless for you to implement. Thank you. Now, let's shift our attention to the issue of multiple taxation. Um, small businesses in Nigeria are battling with this. In fact, according to the report released by the committee, you know, manufacturers are obliged to pay up to like 60 different taxes why even motorists moving from north to south are also battling with 60 different you know, taxes. Talk to us, what's the implication of this and how can this shortfall be managed? Ah, the issue of multiplicity, multiplicity of taxes has been on before now. It's not a new thing and it's even getting worse. I can tell you the level of, this is January, the level of tax demands that have been coming to companies as we're starting this new year has been rising. And this is likely to continue. It's not good for business because number one, it makes business environment to be ash because it's like you must pay or you don't do anything. Number two, it increases the cost of doing business. And number three, it is passed on to the consumer of whatever goods is being produced. And that is not going to help us because we're talking about there is increase in fuel price, uh, we're talking about issues around um, exchange rates. Those ones already have their impact. And by the time we add all these smaller, smaller bits of levies, charges, and the likes, which are not within the law, we found a situation whereby we have a federal law, Cap T2, LFN 2004 as amended. Uh, that's the taxes and levies approvals for collection, which states what federal, state, and local government should collect. Everything in this act is no more than 39, spread across federal, state, and local government. 
But now they're talking about 60 different tax taxes. What is the implication? The cost of doing business will go on the high side. The businesses will be under pressure to pay what is not legal. I permit me to use that word legal because in some cases there are no laws. And there are other things that are unconstitutional. We have cases whereby some laws are enacted and they are conflicting with even the rules in the constitution of some of these um, um, uh, of the bodies that are enacting the laws. So I think we need to streamline this. And this is one of the things that I, the, the, the commission, uh, uh, the committee is looking at. How do we streamline this? Make it easy for business. Why well, businesses are leaving Nigeria. Is it what we want? No. We want to be developed. We want businesses to develop. We want indigenous and even foreign direct investments to come in. If we are having this, even our indigenous companies are not um, finding it funny with multiplicity of taxes. If you work in 36 states, it means that across every state, you must pay double what you're paying, even triple at times because of everybody that wants to collect. You are in one state and there are local governments. Out of the 774 local government in Nigeria, if all of them will be asking you to pay the same thing at the same time because you are across the, the nations of the, or, or, or the, the states of the country, then you can imagine what that would be. And the consumers will say, sorry, things are expensive. So it is high time we let the, the people know that the cost of production is impacted by not only the, 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 the cost of raw materials, it's also impacted by all these levies, charges, and everything. It goes into the, the cost. It goes into the bottom line. And no company will come and say, I want to do business. Even if it's a PLC, your shareholders are expecting returns. Otherwise, as good as their, their investment is, is trashed. So I think it will be good for this to be streamlined so that business, it can be ease of business, part of the ease of business objective. It will also be good for us to have clear. You know, there should be clarity. There should be, um, uh, you must be sure of what you're paying. Let me give an example. If I'm paying uh, my company's income tax, it's expected that that is supposed to be used uh, by the federal government, and part of this will also be allocated to states for their projects. We pay VAT. VAT is shared by the three tiers of government. Now, the same company uh, same uh, will now also pay the state taxes and levies. Payee is paid by the employees, which also goes to government of the states and the FCT for the purpose of government projects. Now, those ones are there. You now have what we call infrastructure maintenance levy. We have road levy. We have signage levy. We have advertisement levy and all those things. And everything now still boils down to the same taxpayer. So it's just going to be too much for the businesses to bear. And at the end of the day, the consumers will continue to co com co complain that the cost of, their, of the goods are on the high side. Okay. In uh, the reform as well, uh, there is also the um, recommendation that the tax net should be expanded rather than increase tax and make businesses pay more taxes. It should be expanded to include those who are not paying tax. Now, in your assessment, are there certain groups that are not included in the tax net that it should expand to? Um, it, when we talk about expanding the tax net, um, it's very clear. It's easy for the tax authorities to capture companies that are established, their name, their names are out there, but it's not easy for the uh, tax authorities to capture the briefcase companies. And that is where collaboration with the CAC needs to come in. Do we know all the companies registered? It's expected that as they come in, they register, so the CAC can now have a handshake with the FIRS or the states that we have the, the FIRS, let's say the FIRS at the federal level, that we have these companies that have been established. Are they in the tax? Are they paying their taxes? Are they filing their tax returns? So these are the type of expansion that we look for. Not the people that are paying, but those who are not paying, they are established in Nigeria, they come in, they do one thing or the other. And we have other agencies of government that register them. There must be that way of picking them. When we come to the states, the CSC also register business names. Are they also in handshake with the state that these business have been registered to, start, to be established in your state? Are they also remitting their taxes, filing their returns under the state uh, uh, personal income tax act that covers individuals, body of individuals, and the likes? So that handshake also be there. So when we talk of expanding, we're not saying those who are already there. We're talking about those who are not there. And I believe that people are not there. We're talking in terms of the, I've just given an example, people that are registered, they are not in the net, some may have been there operating business. 
when business deal with business and you have tax obligations, do you ensure that you get the other party to fulfill their tax obligations by being an advocate? A lot of times we hide some of these things if we do, but if you come to me and you're not done, you cannot give me evidence that you are, you are, you are registered for tax, I would ask for it because, I, because it is obligation of everybody to ensure we all pay tax. And then we have the informal sector. They are the largest server, 60 something percent. If we need to see how do we get them to come in, understand the obligations when it comes to tax, pay the right tax to be paid. I don't, I don't believe in paying more than what you're supposed to pay as a tax obligation. Pay the right amount of tax. Now, when we are able to bring in the informal sector, those who are registered and are doing business one way or the other, for, for instance, now, the non-residents have now started coming in. I'll tell you that uh, a, 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 an educational outfit like LinkedIn is now going to tell you, if I'm doing anything for you, I'm registered to collect tax, to collect VAT. So when I invoice you, I invoice VAT, pay me the VAT and I'll go and remit to FIRS. So we are having that come in. So once we are able to get all the people that are supposed to pay tax to pay tax, we can minimize the, the impact and we can also show them that what you pay as a government, we are accountable and we are using it to make life better for citizens and everybody will be better for it. Interesting. Now let's look at the issue of tax waiver. Um, uh, last year, the National Assembly had to query, you know, the executive actually gas, you know, arbitrary granting of waivers and all that. Now, let me read to you, you know, part of the recommendations by this committee says tax break for private sector in respect of wage increases to low income earners, transport subsidy and net increase in employment. Now, let's look at the issue of tax waiver. How will you assess the manner at which uh, the federal government has been approaching this in recent times? And what will be the impact of this on the economy or when it comes to revenue generation? Okay, um, when it comes to tax waivers, we also need to um, understand what waivers are for. Waivers are actually supposed to be for economic uh, development. There are some waivers that are given to some sectors because we want to develop the economy in that area. I am not against such waivers. For instance, if we want to develop agriculture and we are giving special waivers for agriculture, not indefinitely, I need to make that clear. Giving it to them for the time when they need to develop, when they need to um, get stabilized, you know, agriculture as a gestation period. You consider a waiver for them once the business is able to stand and is generating profits, is able to roll over whatever they have, the business is doing well, then there's no need for waiver. So waiver should actually be targeted at some economic benefit. For tax waivers, should it be a thing that goes to certain businesses, certain industries per time, so that uh, that relief is felt by most industries at least once in a while, or it has to be selected industries and that's it, is a carpet thing for selected industries. Okay, um, tax waivers is not supposed to be selected and the casting stone. Um, for tax waivers to be considered, the first will be what is the economic need of those industry? Do we need to develop a particular industry? Um, for instance, I know at a point we had some um, relief. You know, we have the, um, the tax holidays that are given to specific industries and it's time bound, three to five years. That's in the law. We have a special act that now talks about how those holidays are going to happen, the condition for approval and what they're supposed to do. In such a case, especially for pioneer companies, they are to have uh, an annual report of the contribution they are making to the economy, employment, development of, uh, of the economy, capital investment, and things like that. So the first three years, they need to report. It, they can now apply for additional two years, believe that within five years, they would have stabilized they would have been able to make some contributions or recoup the investments they have made and be able to start contributing in taxes. So they get a tax-free period 
or five years. So also for companies that are into gas utilization under the Companies Income Tax Act, so that we don't flare gas again, they are given incentive, incentive of three to five years also. Once they are able to stabilize and then we can get some other ways of using our gas, which led us into the CNG now that we're not talking about. So tax incentive is not because we just want to favor some industries. It's because we want to develop some sectors of the economy. And once there's an, what we want is that an assessment as this incentive achieved its objective for that particular sector. If yes, then it should be revisited. It should be removed and then let them start to contribute to the tax net. That is how we believe tax incentives should be run. Now we have things around three zones. We have the export processing zone. What is the whole essence? To encourage people to export goods out of the country and bring back the foreign exchange so we can have our foreign exchange reserve boosted. This is the objective. So it's, there's need to be reviewing these incentives and be sure that it has not outlived its purpose. That's what we're saying. Let's look at the issue of technology. You know, part of the recommendations of this committee is to deploy technology to drive uh, tax uh, revenue and you know tax policies in Nigeria. They call it data for tax. But aren't you worried with the kind of infrastructural deficit that we have here if that will see the light of the day? Um, I, I think it's a development that whether we like it or not, it will happen. Um, the fact that we have infrastructure deficit should not stop us from moving towards the trend of events in every other country. I would say that um, we don't need to start when we have the big technology or the, we already have something we can use for data for tax. And if you listen very well to the chairman of the committee, Taiwo Yedele, he said, we have NIN. How useful is the NIN? We have BVN. How useful is the BVN? Now, if you want to do anything today, your bank account is tied to your BVN. And if you want to go for international passport, your passport is tied to your NIN. So the question is, what else can we make use of this information? That is data. Do we have a good database of taxpayers, both state and federal? Do we have a good database of tax collection by taxpayer, by industry, time within a particular time? Can we provide our data of tax collection for the past five to 10 years? We need to have some, we have something in place. Let's even start from what we have. Let's maximize the usage of the data we have. As we go along, we start to look at how can we step up? We cannot be starting from artificial intelligence where you don't even have the normal intelligence. We should first of all use our normal intelligence to be able to drive compliance, to be able to drive responsibility and accountability so that we can, taxpayers can know that we have what it takes to even start this process. And I know that the data for tax that he's talking about is not until when we have a big technology or go and get the big tech companies. Let's even start with the basic information that we have. Every company, pay, if the, then the government starts to publish the FIRS um, accounts of tax collection, tax expenditure, their running activities, their capital expenditure, maybe that will start to make us know, oh, government knows what they're doing. Because we need to have, um, to show that all this information we provide, we file monthly returns, we file annual returns, we file all this. And it's supposed to be for government to track the performance of people in terms of compliance. So compliance does not need for you to have a big technology to be able to track whether people are paying the right tax or not. We have bank, bank transactions. Now we don't have cash. Everybody is now struggling. We have we people now, only the people that can afford with that is POS. You can't even do across the counter bank transactions now. You have to do transfers. How have we been able to use this to legitimately determine those who have filed the tax, who have paid their taxes and not just paid the right taxes? But what we observe is that we are going after those who are paying tax and asking them to pay more, where some are not even in the tax net at all. 
So this is what we are talking about data for tax. The data we have now, have we used them? How effective have we used them? That's my understanding. Now, before we now start talking about high technology, let's even use what we have to be able to estimate where are we on tax payment, on tax compliance, on tax collection, and then be able to start from somewhere. That's my thought. Okay, the, the concentration seems to be on the FIRS as the federal body, but every state has their own inland revenue service. So what should the state's inland revenue service do in this regard, particularly as it concerns the informal sector? Now, you talked about natural intelligence before artificial intelligence. With the different data that we have collected by different agencies, how do we harmonize that to reflect our peculiar environment for those who have not registered their business, the traders in the markets, but they have to pay taxes as well? How do we get data and bring them in and then it's on the record that they do pay their taxes? Okay. Um, for the states, is I think for states it's easier because each of these non-informal sector has a group. And I know at a point, uh, even if we look at our amendment to Personal Income Tax Act in 2011, there's a, there's a section on presumptive tax regime. I know states like Lagos have been working using that. They've done, uh, I know they've done, uh, is it Bile Hub or something that they've used to make people to pay tax, especially in the informal sector. I am aware of their informal uh, sector uh, unit, how they go to market women, come to their level, explain to them what they need to know, and see how they can get them to pay their tax. Knowing fully well that this set of people are not people that have audited accounts and all those uh, formal processes, there must be a way around it. I know of some states that do what we call um, presumptive regime, whereby they will tell them to pay maybe 50 naira per day for something, or work out an estimate. How much do you buy? How much do you sell? This is what you can get. And then go to the market, have their people on ground, going to the markets to educate them and to tell them how to pay. And I can tell you that if you go to a market like My12, you would see some of these people, uh, they have some offices there that educate them. So for the informal sector, it just takes the states to understand the terrain of the informal sector, how best to reach out to them. We have Market Women Association, we have um, all the Artisans Association, we have the Okada Riders Association. Why can't we leverage on this association? They have a data of their members. The data of their members will give you an idea of those who you know have been coming to do their small, small tax payment and those who have not contributed at all. So this is what we are talking about. The states can also leverage on this. I know some say that I will say that for you to, if, if you're in a particular business, this is what you can pay every, every month as your part payment of your taxes because they have an idea of how the turnover comes and everything. They work out something. So it requires some intelligence on the part of the state to also be able to guide this informal sector so that they can come up with something that may make them to pay the tax. Maybe not the full tax, but at least something that shows their tax compliance status.